hello, 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 y'all. We are back again. Listen, this conversation today is going to be one that will take us all to a place where we get to identify the choices and the decisions that we have made and then take a very hard look at what have we experienced in this life, whether it is loss, whether it is gain, whether it is lessons, whether it is blessings, but take a look at all of those things and decide how do we want our lives to look, how do we want our lives to feel, and how do we want to operate throughout each and every one of those experiences. Beautiful. This, this is about to be a good one. So go ahead. I need you to go ahead and share it now. You don't even got to get into it. Just know it's going to be good. All the rest of it good. This is going to be good too. So go on ahead. Share it now with a trigger happy family member. Send it to your mama, your pappy. Trust me. Everybody needs to hear this one. Okay? So we have with us today truly one of the kindest humans I have ever met. Aww. We met in Africa, right? Yep. We met in Africa. Um, from the moment I met her, there was just something about, you know how people like um, are illuminated from the inside out? I don't even know what that name is or what you call it, but like bright lights, that's what you were when I first met you. And there was- This is the first time she's saying this, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's really touching my spirit. <laughs> there was a kindness, like you, when you just meet people who are just genuinely kind. Oh, thank you, babe. There's like a, it's really, really attractive. Especially, I know I'm kind. So when I'm even a kind person, yep. I just be like, oh, can we mm -hmm. explain this? Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Energy, yep. Yeah. Yes. I saw you in the dining room. I'm like, who is she? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, we'll sit over there. Can I sit with them? Like, and she was dressed to the nines. Like, listen, I was as like, cute as she I'm is. coming now, over. She was cute then, too. I just inserted my way. Listen, know. and I was so happy. I was grateful group. for it. I was <laughs> grateful for it. And then when I found out that she is just as smart, if not smarter, uh, than she is beautiful. Because first of all, she is an integrative medical cannabis emergency medical professional. Listen, say that three times. <laughs> and not even professional, physician. Let me let me put some respect on your name. So it's Dr. Safia Lynn. Oh, we have my pleasure. Yes. Listen, we have her here with us today and I'm super excited. How are you? I am well. Thank you both for having me. Yes, Triggered so AF. Excited. Let's go. Let's get into it. it. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm ready. Let's get triggered. No, I'm so excited. She was like, <laughs> raving about you Aww. um and she we we bring like you know people we know yes. obviously we touch we reach out to our network mm -hmm. to get these wonderful guests and she's like we ha I have someone we have to have her <laughs> and then you it was like a last minute thing and you did it so thank you already just so much oh, for being my here I'm so excited and one of um my favorite things about our guests is just how dynamic they are and how prolific they are where they wear so many hats yes and a lot of the times when you are mother sister Ooh. um friend doctor mm -hmm. we have we've had lawyers on we've had ceos entrepreneurs yes. i mean there's just so many titles that a lot of us wear yeah. And it's rare that we stop and kind of think about who we say we are. So the number, the question that we ask all of our guests, no matter the topic, is who do you say that you are? Excellent question. Um, I saw that on your list of questions and I was like, man, I don't really even know anymore. You see, it's a thing. Like we have, we have people say that. We're like, I don't even think about that before. But it's like, we're so defined by our titles that exactly. we don't get to like think about it. So if you can now, take yes. a second and think about it and tell us. Perfect, um, perfect statement, perfect segue. So for so long, I have been an emergency medicine physician or Myla's mom or Alana's daughter or, or Malcolm's wife or this person. And when you lose some of those titles, you start to lose some of your identity. Like when mm -hmm. I lost my husband, I'm like, I'm not anybody's wife anymore. Who am I? I'm a widow now. So even mm -hmm. that change from being single to married to widow was just like, <gasps> What does this mean for me? You know, so that was a personal identifier that changed. And then in the pandemic, your role and title of physician and doctor became exponential times 20. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. So the appreciation and the value for your work. So that identified me for the past, I'd say, three years consistently. Mm -hmm. And then on top of all that, first and foremost, always a mom. You know yeah. how that is. Yeah. Both always of you know how that is. Always a mom, no matter what's going on in life and what's, what's uh, 
you're having to manage and balance always a mom. And that's one thing that will always take precedence and priority. Yeah. But I find that in my 40s now, I'm 42. Those First titles, of all, <laughs> what? Yeah, I'll let you 42. finish. Ooh, Those child. titles Amazing. don't define me as much as they used to. Mm-hmm. You know, when people say, oh, what do you do or who you are? And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm blessed to be present. I'm blessed to be here. Yeah. Joyful to share my energy, see what we can engage in, how we can collaborate. You know, yeah. it's always in tension with positivity. Yeah. And I think I'm honestly redefining who I am, minus the titles, but more so based off of my peace and intention. Yes. So that has been very um at the forefront of what I'm trying to do in my transparency and my goals and my in my you know path for the next few years like the thing that has been continuing to stand out for me it's like okay what do you want your legacy to be what do you want being known for what is what is memorable for you you don't want to be known as the ER doctor you don't be known as this like I want to be known as someone that made you feel good so yeah. when you say that we had that beautiful interaction in Africa, and I was like, I didn't even know this girl. Like, I just <laughs> yeah. liked her. I liked her energy. She was over there dancing in the corner. I'm like, I want to be her friend. You know, I'm always dancing. With somebody. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm, I'm so excited to <laughs> because yeah, that's a big part of our dynamic. Yes. is we're always the girls on the dance floor. Exactly. Yeah. So it's fun, like when, the yeah. Fun so when crew. we get a chance to have fun, because we do all this deep shit all the time. Exactly. Okay? So it's like important because. You know, we, you guys know that we go city to city to record yeah. and we very rarely have time to play. And decompress. Yeah. yeah. So yes. yeah, she's definitely that girl that is <laughs> on the dance floor. No, that's and it's joy. important to have those friends because one, they encourage you to get out on the dance floor mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. And that's not just a dance floor, literally, literally, but figuratively as well. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I am so honored and touched to hear you say that the way that I made you feel or how you felt in that moment and in our in our grace and in our interaction, it just means so much more to me than saying, oh, this is a Safia, the ER physician, or oh, this is Dr. Lynn, the medical cannabis physician. Like the interaction and, and the feeling that you left with means so much more now than I valued previously. Yeah. yeah. Cause that's yeah. what I remember. I yeah. even remember like when we got back from Africa, I still didn't even know what you did all the way. <laughs> But I just remember you were this dope human. And I was like, nah, it's a kindness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That whole people remember how you make them feel is yes. something that is, you you can't put it into words sometimes. Mm-hmm. You just know, like, no, this right here yeah. feels genuine. It feels authentic. And it just feels really, really good. Yeah, yeah. definitely. But the thing, 100. too, though, about that feeling good is, is sometimes, especially now, because in my belief, I feel as though every extraordinary thing is truly on the other side of right. fear. The things that scare us to be willing to go to Africa with a bunch of women. Yeah, I do not, do not know. know. Yeah, absolutely. Like, definitely. That's terrifying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know y'all like that. Mm-hmm. You may not like me because either you love me or you really can't stand my ass. Either There's or. No, either or. There is no in between. Ask exactly. my ex-husband. Ain't no in between. <laughs> <laughs> Black <laughs> or white out here. I really, really love you. I can stand your money right like now. One or the two. <laughs> But for me, though, that that every extraordinary thing being on the other side of fear, it requires that you step out. And we're taught so much to fear not only our own shadow, but our own light. We're taught to fear anything that is different from what we've already done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when you had to redefine and as you are continuing to redefine the titles, um, after there have been transition and, and even loss and changes, how have you moved through that fear? Because literally when I met you, it was like like a light, kind of like um, when you put ooh, a, a lamp under a shade. Yes. Yeah. No matter mm-hmm. how yeah. much shade you put on it, that light, you still, you, still, you still, still see right. that illumination. Right. When my daughter's trying to sneak on her phone mm-hmm. night, and she puts the phone <laughs> under the covers and I'm just like, like you don't sis. understand yet. I can still <laughs> see this. That's how your life has been. And then when I, I learned more about your story, I was like, how are you this happy? <laughs> what is it's, it? It's, that has been a daily practice. Mm. You know, that's been a, a daily practice and a daily intention to 
not let my story define who I am, you know? Mm. And I think I got to this place by taking ownership and power of my story. So not letting anybody else tell it, you know, and being much more transparent and open and just, you know, kind of honest with what I've been through and now where I'm at, you know, and so many people want to focus on the either the woe is me or I've overcome. I'm like, no, sis, let's go through the whole journey, you know, like let's go through the journey in between is what really created who you are, Mm -hmm. you know, those moments that you don't want to you know, adapt to or adhere to or, or anything like that or, or ashamed of or acknowledge or acknowledge or yeah. too painful to to put a pulse on it. Yeah. Those are the moments that really helped create and define who who I am today. Yeah. So at no point in my journey do I ever discredit the fact that I had an amazing husband who I lost um, seven years ago and has been integral in creating and manifesting all of my dreams, you know, and continues to be my protector and guider today. So bad vibes, bad energy, business deals, anything that I'm trying to navigate, you know, sitting still with it and watching for signs and feeling those moments. That's all him coming to me and saying, all right, move there, do this, invest here. Like this is the best move for you. So I I really trust and believe in that power that that is my guardian angel for everything, my daughter and myself and my family move with so even though physically he's not present today his spirit transcends so much greater and i hear him more clear now than i ever did before you know remember i met my partner in my 20s yeah Yeah, 20s like (laughs) yeah we're trying to see what it is like is this even my one like i didn't know you know so your 20s you're you're kind of figuring out what is important i knew for me i needed an amazing father because i didn't have that example growing up so those were the qualities that were like okay it was love it was friendship and it was fatherhood Mm -hmm. those were the key things that i was looking for in a partner and i found all of that in him and then on top of that he had an amazing awareness of spirituality and presence with god so those are all things that touched me about him right and now in my 40s i'm like looking for more of a partner Mm. you know so that partnership element or someone that you can grow with or build with or get some money with like because that's a love language can we we get a check together like can we start an llc can we invest like yeah like a trust i never thought about that like yeah. you know yeah. I, I never i never even crossed my mind in my mm-hmm. 20s and 30s so i'm like i'm you gonna get it if you don't got it i'm gonna get it we gonna have it like you know it yeah. was always like a go-getter mentality for the family like let's figure it out yeah. but now as i get older i'm like who can i build with who's gonna help me scale yes who who believes yes. in my vision mm-hmm. like who can i who can i manifest with you know yeah Ooh. who can i who can i share my dreams with that's the most protective part about me now. I'm like, I'm not really giving you all that. Like, I'm not really, not really getting into my dreams, like my yeah. goals, like, you know, because you, you are very, um, you're very guarded with those things. You know, sometimes you can see your baby light and energy yeah. and people will just, girl, you can't do that. Like, right. and you're like yeah. that's not the, what I needed to hear. Like, you're talking to me. Like, I can do it all. Yeah. So, like, and if I can, I'm going to hire somebody. Like, can. Like, exactly. You know? What are we doing? Exactly. Yeah. It's true. That's like, it's funny that you're talking about rebuilding because I think a lot of times, especially when people experience loss or mm-hmm. just even any drastic mm-hmm. change, you know, it can be very traumatic. Mm-hmm. And even though some of these things are inevitable, right? Like we right. all know that these things are going to happen. But for some reason, one, I think, especially within Western culture, we're not as prepared for mm-hmm. those things. Mm-hmm. Like there are societies that like very much have such an understanding with the afterlife and with yes. death and things like that, mm-hmm. that when yeah. people transition, there's such a, different understanding Mm -hmm. and conceptualization of what's actually happening that it's not, I'm sure it's still traumatic, but they just seem to handle it Mm -hmm. in a different way. 
And a lot of times for us on, on this side of the world, in this country, because we're like going, 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 when things hit right. us, it's like, oh shit. It's like, stop. Yeah. And yeah. It, it really affects us. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it can render people pretty like, I don't know, like it can like paralyze you. Absolutely. Like you can feel like I can't do anything else. Like so many people, I was telling her yesterday this story about this woman. Mm-hmm. She had the Guinness World book records, uh, record for the longest nails in the world. Mm. And her nails are like, I'm talking about like feet long. <laughs> like they're like, if they had to be removed in a certain way, because if they cut them the wrong way, like she could right. lead to that. Like right. they were oh. all like a part of like oh, their physiology. So wow. I'm watching the thing and I'm like, why would she like, why? And the reason why her nails were so long is because her daughter had painted her nails and her daughter passed away Gosh. and she didn't want to cut her nails because she didn't want the nail polish, like the last thing mm-hmm. that she had with her daughter mm-hmm. to be gone. Wow. You know what I mean? And I was wow. just like, I, it just, for some reason, it just stuck with me because I was like, wow. Mm-hmm. Like her, she decided that her life was just going to be like on pause. Yeah. You know, because imagine the things that she can't do anymore because of her nails. Oh, yeah. Because she's holding on to this Absolutely. thing. So yeah. Alicia was telling me just how, how just much you, you do and how much you just mm-hmm. kind of rebuilt your life. So how do you feel like you honor your late husband while kind of rebuilding your life and like navigating but not feeling because I know with I've had very close loss as well and I remember sometimes moving on made me feel guilty yeah mm-hmm. like I used to feel mm-hmm. like oh, I'm doing this without him or we're celebrating right. Christmas without him Thanksgiving right. like I remember that, that first maybe seven eight years yeah. almost a decade mm-hmm. to 15 years now but I want to say like that first decade like we would feel guilty as a family for moving forward and like you feel bad for living almost like you feel guilty. So what has that been like for you and how do you navigate that, but still honor him in a way that helps you to kind of grieve still? Great question. Um, It's um, from day one. I've always, and we, I would say my entire family have always spoken of Malcolm in a very active present sense. So it's never like he used to do this or he loved pizza or he enjoyed going to the basketball games or he was an amazing basketball player. Like it's always very active. I'm like, girl, dad would love these wings. Like this is his thing right here. Like, you know, let's get the lemon pepper today. Like we speak about him very actively and present. And the language um, behind that is to help my daughter. She was five when he passed. So it's really to help myself and help my daughter understand that even though physically he's not present, spiritually, emotionally, absolutely and, so and as our guardian, he's always here. Yeah. No matter who I meet or, or if I pursue a new relationship, he's always watching over us. Yeah. So that language that helped us to understand his impact and his presence daily is um, something that's been really key. Mm-hmm. I remember intentionally though like you know when I first brought Myla back to school and um after losing my husband and the and the um crossing guard was like hey where's Malcolm and I'm like not here today <laughs> like, like it took me two years to oh, tell wow. to tell the crossing guard at the school like he ain't coming back today like oh. though he's gone you know yeah. and I remember for a long time probably like six months after he passed you know people you haven't seen in a while or people who didn't know you that well yeah. um we're like hey is how Mal doing I'm like he's good like you know it took oh, me a wow. while because what happens is when people ask you that, mm. then you have to go into, oh, yeah, well, the story. And you got to yeah. keep reliving it. And it's just Malcolm like, passed away in Atlanta. Yeah. It's been two years now. Like, you know, yeah, you have, and you thing. relive yeah. it every yeah. time you speak about it. Yeah. And so you can never really like heal exactly. and work through yeah. it because you keep on. You're judging it Every yes. layer. You keep cutting yeah. yourself. Every, every time I think it's gapped over. over and I was good, it's like just open back up again. Yeah. yeah. So I, I be I begin and I was like, this ain't fucking healthy. I can't <laughs> doing this shit. Yeah. This man is gone. Like let me let me figure out a new a new you know kind of language and and paragraph. Yeah. So what helped me more and through therapy was to be like, okay this is my message. This is my, this is my rebuttal. You know, when you're prepared to answer a question, yes. you're a little bit more like, okay, on point versus yes. being like, uh, oh, mm, you know, like yeah. and you're taken off guard. So finally I, I like kind of 
navigated my language in terms of what to say when people ask me that okay. and it helped me to move through it a better. little bit better yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and it was never a delusion like is he coming back that uh, no he was gone gone like i work in the er i am an emergency medicine physician i deal with death daily and my strength and my weakness is compartmentalization so i have mm. the power to code a patient in bed eight and then go see an ankle sprain in bed three you know mm. so i yeah. still be compassionate and for bed still, three yeah and still understand that this person there's nothing else i can do in bed they're eight. gone exactly so wow. it's it's a strength and a weakness because i kind yeah. of do it in relationships too Ooh. So when you are upset with this person or when you are in a state that you can't process your feelings or emotions, mm -hmm. put it in that little box, you put it on the shelf and move on. And don't deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's okay. you. That's me. Don't I know. I was like, deal with it. <laughs> yeah. Don't deal with it. Yeah. Or you might pull it back out a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, but you really don't give it the due justice yeah, that it put, deserves. I'm going to <laughs> and it's rude. It's, it's so it's rude, so rude to the other person. So, so it's so just so bad, and it makes we talk about this all the time yes. here. But it makes people feel like they're disposable. Yes, to you. exactly. And that is what mm -hmm. I'm working through is learning yeah. how to deal with the conflict mm -hmm. <laughs> and in, not, real time. in real time, in real time, time yeah. yeah, and not put them on the shelf mm -hmm. a little bit because it really quite it makes them question their role in your life exactly. so much yes. more mm -hmm. than they really have to. Because you can, I can be like obsessed with mm -hmm. you. I love you. You. Yeah, it's, like it's, I, without I, a doubt, I, I yes. love you. Can't live without you. Yeah, but you can go but without 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 you can <laughs> absolutely go on the shelf for a good week, and then I'll yeah. pull you back out next week yeah. and be like, okay, I'm ready. Yeah. Like, well, I was ready a week ago. Yeah. How are you just getting ready? You know, yeah. I don't even want to talk about it now. Yeah, so, exactly. exactly. <laughs> and you're like, well, I'm ready. Yeah. Okay. Why aren't you? Why aren't you ready? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that that strength and that weakness for me has been very difficult and challenging in relationships because it's like you're not addressing things at the moment that it occurs, which yeah. feels dismissive to the other person. But it's really how I cope with work, Ooh. and that has become my superpower you know yeah. it allows me to be dynamic impactful graceful and to flow through the er no matter what comes your way yeah you know we could be doing good and then five minutes later the shit blows up you know we have a three pile car accident on 95 yeah. and da, da, da. like it just goes from second to second yeah. in terms of not being able to anticipate or expect what your work night is going to look like and what your shift is going to look like yeah so it is something that um I'm trying to figure out and, and trying to understand how can I do this in a healthy manner and not not um, use that tool in relationships to yes. deflect from what I really need to address. So, it's like a, an on and off switch. Yes. Yeah. And, so, and it's that easy. So that's like what that. I learned how to mm -hmm. do because um, if you guys have ever listened to this podcast, you know, I grew up really impoverished. Mm -hmm. Um, my mother is love her dearly. She's also, you know, she's certifiable. Yeah. Um, she's had some very, very real struggles, real challenges. Um, she is a hoarder and she's had some major mental, yeah. you know, issues. Uh, she lost her mind, uh, for a number of years when I was mm -hmm. younger. And also, she also had the wherewithal to understand that, Hey, I'm never going to be able to get my kids out of poverty with where and who and how I am. So let me barter cleaning services mm. so that my kids could be private school educated. Even Isn't though it's it crazy a part of how cult. she bartered cleaning services but hoarded everything? Hoarded every... I was 16. Every newspaper, Listen, every magazine. Everything. I was 16 but she with would baby clothes. do cleaning services. She cleaned so well. But she would wouldn't clean, clean and unpack her, her own stuff. Everybody else's house, she would go and spend yeah. hours cleaning it. It yeah. took me, I used to talk to my therapist, but I was like, I hated her mm. because I was like, you really don't give a shit about mm. me. You mm. don't care. Mm. You don't care that I have clean panties so the kids pick on me because I stink. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, you don't care that nobody can come to our house right. because there's so much stuff. So and if they saw how we lived, they, they would call. Mm -hmm. We could get in trouble. They could no, diapers. they would take yeah. us. And that's what my mom would tell yeah. us and my dad. Like, mm -hmm. you can't tell anybody how we're living because yeah. they would come and take you. Yeah. yeah. Like, to know all of that. And then also to be going to a school, even though, yes, it was, it was a pseudo cult, but to be going to a school where the kids' parents drove, 
BMWs right. and, yeah. and their parents seem to care yeah. about them and their parents. And then adults would tell us that our parents didn't care about us. Right. Like these awesome Christian adults would tell us like how much our mom didn't care about us and how our dad didn't like us because they didn't, you know, give us certain foods or provide certain things for us. Yeah. So it was incredibly, I became super tough. Yeah. I fought everybody. I yeah. fought boys. I fought girls. I fought teachers. You you started it. Oh, I was going to finish it exactly. and fight you. Exactly. Because I was so angry. And so what I did as I started to grow up, and I'm like, okay, we're going to have to do something different. Right. We're going to have to pick up. <laughs> this can't be it. I can't this keep can't be fighting life. Yeah. my entire life. Mm-hmm. And so what I did is, is I named the part of me that needed to protect me, needed to feel safe, needed to be able to compartmentalize so that I wouldn't lose my mind right. knowing that I'm 12 having to, you know, work yeah. to make sure we could eat or I'm 14 mm-hmm. changing my one mm-hmm. company to another company yeah. because I need to make more money because we don't have enough. Mm-hmm. And so I just named that person. At the time, that person's name was Melissa. Mm-hmm. And Melissa would be the person who she was the strong one. She would right. take care of all the things. And sometimes I'm like, does that make me, you know, does that mean I have borderline personality? <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> but what I did is mm-hmm. I needed to be able to own who that part of me was mm-hmm. yeah. without throwing and kicking her out of the door. Right. Like I didn't need her because no, I needed her. I would not have survived my childhood without, without that. Yeah. But then now in my relationships, I'm Alicia. Mm-hmm. Alicia is kind. Alicia is gentle. Alicia mm-hmm. is super loving. Yeah. Alicia is delicate. Like I get to be who I truly am. Right. And then when I need to, now her name is Lola, and Lola is <laughs> so Melissa next has level. Lola. <laughs> Lola is next level Melissa. Um, but Lola doesn't like to be as Lola's not as physical. Right. Melissa was physical as fuck. Mm-hmm. Like, Melissa is going to scrap. Yeah. <laughs> Lola's a different rap. Yeah, L- yeah, Lola is a little scarier. Yeah. But for me, that worked for me in that I get to identify who do I need to be in this area and part of my life. And I turn on and I allow myself to fully be that. Right. And then once I step out of that arena, I get to be who I truly am. Right. So it might work for you, especially as you are redefining who you yeah. are, to get to decide, okay, who is Safia? outside of this role right that yeah. i do have to play it's a role i gotta play like yeah we like money and money mm-hmm. likes us mm-hmm. <laughs> absolutely yeah no definitely yeah definitely so it's a role help. it's absolutely a role and understanding that you are playing a role for for so long i think i've become synonymous with the two roles oh. and i and what i'm trying to do now is to separate the two yeah but yet honor the two you know because it's like if you've been doing something for 15 years Mm -hmm. it's it's very hard to just kind of turn off and it's not it's not even a reaction that i'm turning off it's a it's actual tool that i'm because it's a part it's a part of you yeah like this is my tool this is how i (laughs) this is how i deal and this is how i manage so trying to Trying to figure that out is um, intentional in this next yeah. phase of my life, which is also, you know, really kind of led me into the cannabis space as well. Yes. Not only has it been a passion of mine, but I also feel like that's going to be more of my legacy than anything else because yeah. it is something that I chose to do, you know? Oh, yes. It's that something choice. that I was not taught in medical school. It's not a um, healing process that was invited it was respected the spirituality aspect of it was never discussed it mm-hmm. was the 80s and nancy reagan was like war on drugs say mm-hmm. no to drugs you know yeah. and <clears throat> marijuana and cannabis was included in that yeah so redefining the purpose of the plant is really special for me at this stage i've been doing medical marijuana since 2016 since florida became legalized and now I'm opening a brand new practice in Aventura, Florida, which Yay! I'm very excited about. Thank That's amazing. you. Thank you. I'm excited for Me you. Me too. And and I think one of the um, motivators, it's something I've wanted to do, but I've been so inundated with the emergency medicine aspect for the last three years yeah. because I felt like my calling and my gift was to be in the ER. You know, mm-hmm. it was a privilege to take care of people yeah. who were 
compromise and suffering with COVID, yeah. you know? Yeah. So it's like, I have the tool. I've, I've learned this process. How can I help? You know, so I jumped right into that action and I let my Ask Dr. Lin and my cannabis side of me become secondary mm, yeah. because my demand was for my emergency medicine career. Yeah. So now that we are seeing a little bit of light and outside light. is opening up and we're looking outside a little bit, like it, it's starting to feel a little bit more realistic. Yeah. Um, so I'm changing not just my new office and my location, but I'm changing my career path. And I've been very intentional in the last year in planning for this. So I did two emergency medicine full-time positions at um, two hospitals, Mount Sinai Hospital and HCA University Hospital. And I just stacked. Mm -hmm. So I stacked money for the last year and I set aside a budget for my new office and set aside a plan like, all right, if this don't pop in the next six months, like, what are we going to do? (laughs) Can we pay these bills? Yes. So (laughs) I set that all aside. (laughs) And now I'm I'm pulling back so that my my intention is now 70% for Ask Dr. Lin and my cannabis aspect and 30% in the emergency um, medicine career, which will start January. Like what you just heard? Want some more? Make sure you're subscribed for the full access behind the scenes community view on our Patreon. Or if you love Apple, you can also subscribe there. And you can do so by going to triggeredafpodcast.com. You can use the top banner or you can go ahead and click those first two buttons to subscribe exactly where you want to. Continue to share, share, share all of our podcasts with your friends with your family members and you can continue to watch just 30 minutes on youtube now so if you want the full episode you better subscribe we will see you soon as a member of our tribe we cannot wait to continue these conversations bye trigger happy fam